start the, I guess, the fall semester. <laughs> okay, and today we'll be taking the, it's called the Chula Satchika Sutta, the shorter discourse to Satchika. You don't have to. Um, Nina, you could sit here and then you could share your book with this woman here. I just don't like princess, that's okay. You don't like what? <laughs> doesn't like good practice. Oh. <laughs> Okay, so this sutta, um, it's a little bit combination, I would call it a little bit like a sit- combination of a situation comedy, but with some serious teachings inside. <laughs> so it has a little bit of a humorous framework. So it begins when there is a certain um, debater, his name is Satsika. The word satchika actually means one who speaks the truth. And he is said to be a son of the Nikantas. The Nikantas were the Jains. So it seems he came from the Jain family. But it's not at all obvious that he is a follower of the Jain teaching. But rather he seems to be something like a... In Greek philosophy they call him the sophist. They're people who are skilled in the arts of debate, and so they travel around the country finding famous teachers, philosophers, and then they just try to debate with them in order to use logic and reasoning to disprove the position of the other person. Okay, so apparently when this sutta opens, Satchika has been visiting the large city of Vaisali, who was one of the major cities in India during the time of the Buddha. And so he's described as a debater and a clever speaker regarded by many as a saint. It seems like being a clever speaker is hardly reason for being regarded by many as a saint. But anyway, he was making a very unsaintly statement in front of the assembly of Vesali. This would probably be a place where the people gather, because Vesali was like a self-governing aristocratic republic rather than a kingdom, a monarchy. And so I would believe that the people would gather in an assembly hall and they would conduct the affairs of the city from that assembly hall, just like small towns here have a town hall where people meet to conduct the affairs of the town. So he comes before this assembly and then he starts speaking rather boastfully, saying that he sees no other ascetic or Brahmin, even one who's the head of an order, the head of a group, the teacher of a group, even one who claims to be fully enlightened, who would not shake, shiver and tremble and sweat under the armpits 
if he were to engage in debate with me, <laughs> then to make his point even more strongly, he says, if I were to engage in debate with a senseless post, a post of wood, even that post of wood would shake, shiver, and, tr and tremble, not to speak about human beings. Okay, so at this time, the Buddha has been living in just outside the city of Vesali, in a place called the Great Woods. And so one of the disciples of the Buddha, this is the monk named Asaji, he was one of the first five disciples of the Buddha, and the one responsible for converting Sariputta and bringing Sariputta to the Dharma. So the Venerable Asaji, one day, he took his alms bowl and he went into Vesali on his alms round. So then Satchika sees Asaji walking on alms round and he comes up to him, greets him, and then he knows, he must know that Asaji is a disciple of the Buddha, the one that they call the ascetic Gautama. And so he asked Asaji, how does the ascetic Gotama discipline or train his disciples? What is the kind of instruction that he usually gives to his disciples? Okay, then Asaji gives a rather very brief statement in order to show what he considers the essence of the Buddha's teaching. So apparently this monk Asaji was not one who liked many words, but even when Sariputta approached him for a teaching, Asaji just gave, spoke one four-line stanza, but that was enough to bring Sariputta to the first stage of enlightenment. Okay, so in this case also, Asaji speaks very concisely and he says, material form is impermanent, feeling is impermanent, perception is impermanent, the mental formations are impermanent, consciousness is impermanent. So in other words, he's saying that the five aggregates are impermanent, then material form is not self, feeling is not self, perception is not self, for mental formations are not self, consciousness is not self, thus all formations or all conditioned phenomena are impermanent, and all things, all phenomena are not self. So that is the way the Buddha trains his disciples, and that is the way he presents his teaching to his disciples. Anything missing here? Yeah, the characteristic of dukkha is missing. Usually we have three characteristics, anicca, dukkha, anatta, right? Impermanent, suffering or unsatisfactory, and non-self. So why is suffering missing? What? <laughs> no, it's an interesting idea. <laughs> but he's, um, Asaji is speaking, is asking, how does the Buddha usually teach his disciples? Yeah, but usually the Buddha speaks about suffering, even though it's inherent. Excuse me? Yeah, I know. But that's what the commentary says. Yes?
No, Asajaya. Asajaya emitted this in order to avoid giving Saka the opportunity to attempt a refutation. Refutation, yeah. Thank you. Of the Buddhist doctrine. Okay. Yeah, that is basically what the comment. That's what the commentary says. Um, you have to wonder. Yeah. And and his powers that maybe this is how he felt he could reach him the best. Hmm. Maybe so. Yeah. I don't have a definite answer in mind. I just wanted to know. (laughs) 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 But it feels like this guy was so caught up in himself. Yeah. That the only valuable teaching, the only. To go very directly for the non-self. Maybe so, maybe so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know any other explanation apart from what the commentary says, so all we could do is sort of speculate that Sutta itself doesn't give an explicit answer. <laughs> okay. So anyway, usually we have three characteristics, but for some reason the characteristic of suffering, it's omitted here. Okay, so now after Asaji replies in this way, um, Satchika is being a little bit, he's trying to be provocative. So, you know, he's trying to put Asaji's teacher down in his presence. So he says, if we have heard what the recluse Gautama asserts, we have indeed heard what is disagreeable. Then he says, perhaps sometime or other we might meet this Master Gotama and have some conversation with him. Perhaps we, he means really means I, might detach him from that evil view. So he's going to argue with the Buddha and try to convince the Buddha to give up this view of impermanence and non-self so that the Buddha will say yes, some things are are permanent some things are self okay, so one time maybe a little bit later the Lichavis were meeting in their assembly hall and then Satchika came to them and said I'm going out to debate with the ascetic Gautama why don't you guys come along and follow me and you'll see something that's going to blow your mind. You're going to see me. Then he says, he says, if this reckless Gotama maintains before me what was said by his famous disciple, the Bhikkhu Asaji, then just as a strong man might grab a long-haired ram by the hair and drag him this way, drag him that way, drag him around. So in debate I'm going to drag the recluse Gotama, drag him this way, drag him that way, drag him around. And another simile about a brewer's workman, I don't know what that's like. Um, I don't have any experience (laughs) brewing liquor. then finally, okay, yeah, actually these are very vivid similes. Um, just as a strong brewer's mixer might take a strainer by the corners and shake it down, shake it up, and thump it about, so in debate I'm going to shake the scotima down, shake him up, and thump him about. And just as a 60-year-old elephant might plunge into a deep pond and enjoy playing the game of hemp washing. I think this, what this actually means is that the people who are in charge of the elephant throw it a pile of hemp, and the elephant takes the hemp and with the trunk and hits one part of the body, hits the other part, hits the head in order to wash itself. So I'm going to enjoy playing the game of hemp, hemp washing with the recluse Gotama. Come, O Lichavis, come, 
today that he puts us mildly, there will be some conversation between myself and the recluse Gautama. Whatever gave you the impression that he was very full of himself? <laughs> He's just going to have a little conversation. <laughs> okay, now the Lichavis, probably they were divided in their degree of faith in, in the Buddha. Some of them were followers of the Buddha, some of them weren't. And so those who were followers of the Buddha Let's say those who are not the followers of the Buddha, maybe those who were very highly impressed with Satchika, thought to themselves or said, who is this recluse Gautama that he could refute Satchika in debate? On the other, on the contrary, Satchika is going to defeat and refute the recluse Gautama. But some of the others who must have been impressed by the Buddha said, who is this Satchika? He won't be able to beat the Buddha, but it's rather the Buddha who's going to refute the Satchika, the Nikanta's son, in debate. Okay, so all of them set out from Vaisali and they go to this hall with the peak roof where the Buddha is living. Okay, when they arrive, they're directed to a little patch of woods where the Buddha is sitting under a tree for meditation. And then this group comes up to the Buddha. They exchange greetings with him. And then, now I'm in paragraph 9, Satchika, after sitting down, he says to the Buddha, he says, I would like to you know, he puts this very mildly. He doesn't want to come on too aggressively. So he speaks very politely. I would like to question Master Gotama about a certain point. If Master Gotama would kindly grant me the favor of answering my question. Okay, so Sachika asked the same question. How do you instruct your disciples? How do you discipline your disciples? And then the Buddha, he must have known the way Asaji had replied. So the Buddha replies in exactly the same way. He says, material form and so on is impermanent, and material form and so on is not self. Thus all formations are impermanent, all dharmas, all phenomena, are not self. That is the way I discipline my disciples, and that is how I usually present instruction to my disciples. Okay, now Satchika, rather than directly attacking the Buddhist position, is going to approach it somewhat indirectly, by using a simile, because I guess this is supposed to be part of his skill as a debater, is to be able to think up similes which he thinks accurate, accurately represent the position of his opponent. And then he'll use the simile as a way of undermining the position of his opponent. And so he says, just as when seeds and plants whatever their kind, grow, increase, and mature, all do so in dependence upon the earth, based upon the earth. And just as what, whatever strenuous works are done, all are done in dependence upon the earth, based upon the earth, so too, a person has material form as self, and based on material form, he produces merit or demerit. A person has feeling as self, he has perception as self, he has the mental formations as self, 
a person has consciousness as self, and based upon consciousness, he produces merit or demerit. So let's maybe try to see the simile or depict it visually. Okay, does this seem like an accurate representation of simile and what it represents? And it's interesting, maybe a little puzzling, that Satchika seems to be making a distinction between the self, which consists of the five aggregates, and the person who does, produces merit or demerit. So the person has or possesses the self, and then the self consists in feeling, perception, uh, the self consists in form, feeling, perception, and so on. But there seems almost to be like a dualistic distinction between the person and the self. It seems to me a little bit strange. What one would say is that if the person has, or let us say, a form, feeling, perception, and so on, of the self, then one would say that the self does merit or demerit. But then what is the self? But form, feeling, perception, and so on. Yeah. 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 Okay, so anyway, let us see how this continues. Okay, so the Buddha now is going to sort of sound him out, to sort of get him to first to reconfirm his view. So he says, the Buddha asks him, are you asserting thus, material form is myself, feeling is myself, perception is myself, the mental formations are myself, consciousness is myself? Okay, then such a admits this, form, feeling, perception, and so on, that is myself. <laughs> such a says, material form, feeling, and so on, this is myself up to consciousness, that is myself, that's what I say, and then he points to the group of leech thieves and says, and so does this great multitude. You know, so it's sort of he's implying that if the great multitude believes something, that makes it true. 
<laughs> like if Glenn Beck or Rush Limbaugh went to stand up and they were to say, Obama is a Muslim, that's what I'm asserting, and so does this great multitude. <laughs> Then they'll all say, yeah, he's a Muslim. <laughs> so that doesn't make it true, the fact that one points to the multitude and they say, yes, yes. And so the Buddha says, what does this multitude really have to do with you? Please stick to your own position. Okay, so then Satchika is sort of stripped of that support of the crowd behind him, and he has to admit, yes, that is my own position, form, feeling, perception, so on. That is myself. Okay, now the Buddha, again, instead of attacking Satchika's position directly, is going to use a different simile in order to undermine Satchika's position. So he asks Satchika a question. And he's referring to him by the name Agi Vesana. That's probably his family name. Satchika was probably his personal name. Okay, so he says, Then I will ask you a question, Agi Vesana. Answer it as you choose. Now, what do you think? Suppose a powerful king, like King Pasenadi of Kosala, or King Ajata Sattu of Magadha, can such a king exercise power in his own realm such that he can execute those who should be executed, fine those who should be fined, and banish those who should be banished? So in India, in the Buddha's time, in northern India, there were two very powerful monarchies. In the far north, there was um, Kosala, that was ruled by King Pasenadi, and in the center east, there was Magadha, the kingdom of Magadha, which was ruled by King Ajata Sattu. And both of them were probably autocratic tyrants who could rule according to their own will. Pasenadi was a follower of the Buddha, so his reign would have been milder. And King Ajata Sattu actually came to power by killing his own father to get the throne uh, without having to wait until his father grew old. So he was more tyrannical, I think. But both of them were absolute monarchs who could do whatever they wanted in their own realm. Okay, so then Satchika replies that this is the case that these two powerful kings exercise that power in their kingdom so that they could execute anybody they want, banish anybody that they wanted, um, find anybody that they wanted. And then he says, even in these communities, these republics, like the Vajian Republic, or the Malan Republic, the people exercise that kind of power collectively in their realms. So certainly these kings could exercise such power. Okay, then the Buddha asks him, when you say, material form is myself, do you exercise any such power over material form so that you could say, let my form be thus, let my form not be thus? In other words, do you have such absolute power absolute control over form that you can, the bodily form, that you can control it in any way according to your will. So whatever you want it to be, it will automatically and instantaneously 
conform to one's will. It will follow your wishes, your intentions. So, you know, if I had that control over this body, then I wouldn't have to buy razors, you know, to shave. You know, I could just say when the whiskers start to get a little long, <laughs> let the whiskers disappear and they would disappear. And if I ever feel like a cold coming on, I don't have to gargle with salt water, take cold medicine, <laughs> or <laughs> take any other kind of treatment, but <laughs> just have to make the will, let that cold go away and it will go away. And, you know, I'm getting old, <laughs> wrinkles start coming, hair turning gray. <laughs> I don't have to use hair dye to make my hair remain brown. <laughs> but I just make the will, let my hair always remain brown, never, the head never get bald, may I not grow old, fall sick. And of course, may I not die, and I won't die. Okay, so the Buddha asks whether you have that kind of power over the body, over material form. And when he asked that question, you know, Satchika was a bright guy, he was intelligent. So he, he saw the point that the Buddha was, was getting at, and so he wasn't going to fall into the Buddha's trap, and so he remained silent. Okay. <laughs> okay, then a second time the Buddha asked him that question, and a second time Satchika remained silent. Okay, then the Buddha says to him, Avivesana answer now, now is not the time to be silent. If anyone asked a reasonable, is asked a reasonable question up to the third time by the Tathagata, and he still does not answer, his head will split into seven pieces there and then. Okay, we think, wow, the Buddha is really cruel and brutal, right? <laughs> you know, always they say, you see, at least some the Buddhists, they compare Buddhism to Christianity, they say, you see, Jesus says the evildoer will go to hell, but Buddha is always very kind and compassionate to everybody. <laughs> so why, why, here he's saying that your head is going to split into seven pieces. But actually the Buddha that's not his own will. He doesn't want Satchika's head to split. <laughs> but this is supposed to be like a fixed principle, that the Buddha is being perfectly reasonable, and he's asking the person the question up to three times. And it was Satchika who engaged the Buddha in debate. The Buddha didn't come up to start arguing with Satchika. <laughs> and so if Satchika keeps silent, you know, he's going back on his original intention of debating with the Buddha. And the Buddha is giving him this warning in advance to protect him from having to undergo this fate. And now, you know, this is to make things very dramatic. I can imagine that, you see, these suttas were passed down orally for hundreds of years. And so those who are teaching the suttas, maybe they would find consider it a little bit boring if you're just giving a blow-by-blow -blow description of a debate. So they want to make the sutta a little bit colorful, you know, like we have, we're watching it on TV, or Steven Spielberg, is that his name? <laughs> Movie? <laughs> you know, like Jurassic Park, or what are some of these others? The Andromeda factor, is that it? Okay, so then suddenly this 
thunderbolt-wielding spirit holding an iron thunderbolt appears. The thunderbolt is burning, blazing, and glowing, and he appears in the air just above Satchika, holding the thunderbolt, thinking, <laughs> if Satchika is asked that question up to three times by the Buddha and he doesn't answer. <laughs> I'm going to split his head into seven pieces. Okay, so the Buddha looks over across at Satchika and sees the spirit holding the thunderbolt. <laughs> and then Satchika looks over, he must get a sense of some flaming presence behind his shoulder. So he turns over to look. <laughs> and he sees that probably a fierce-looking spirit there holding the thunderbolt right above his head. And so then he gets terrified, frightened, alarmed, and he sort of says to the Buddha, please call him off, call him off. I'll answer you. Okay, so now the Buddha asks the question the third time. You know, after this, you can see the teacher is giving the, explaining the discourse, and people in India at the Buddha's time, they'll believe in these spirits. And so they'll all be holding their heads and going, please answer, Satchika, please, please, don't remain silent. Okay, so now the Buddha asked the question the third time, and now Satchika says, he asks, do you have such power or control of the material form so that you can say, let my form be thus, let it become what I want it to be, let my form not be thus, not be the way I don't want it to be. Okay, then Satchika has to admit, no, Master Gotama. Then the Buddha says, pay attention, Satchika. Pay attention to what you've replied. What you said afterwards does not agree with what you said before, and what you said before doesn't agree with what you said afterwards. Now the Buddha is just going to frame the questions around the other aggregates. Do you have such power over feeling that you can control it in any way you want? Satchika says, no. Then, do you have such power over perception? No. Do you have such power over the mental formations, the sankharas? so that you could control them in any way that you want. Satchika says, no. Then the fifth aggregate, do you have such power, such control over consciousness, so that you can say, let my consciousness be thus, let my consciousness not be thus? And Satchika says, no. Okay, so now the Buddha, again, he says, pay attention, Agivesana, pay atten attention how you reply. What you said afterwards does not agree with what you said before, nor does what you said before agree with what you said afterwards. Okay, why is there some contradiction between what Satchika said earlier and what he said afterwards. What is the contradiction? He just said that the self is all those things. Yeah. And now he's saying the self is not, or he has, does not have power over the things that he said was self. Okay, earlier he just said the person has material form is self, feeling is self, and so on, then based on material form, he produces merit or demerit. 
So the person can still do merit or demerit. So where is the contradiction? There's something implicit here which is not stated explicitly. What is that? What is implicit? Well, it's, he's saying that for the self to be identical, for the self to actually possess the five aggregates of the, uh, it must have control over them. Mm -hmm. The possession, the, the idea of the possession needs to control. Okay, that's the good point. But just repeat it with the with the microphone. The assumption is that identity or possession equals control. Yeah. That is exactly the point. So the idea that's sort of implicit here, and this has to do maybe with the way the concept of self was construed in Indian thought at the time of the Buddha, that for something to be self, it must be sort of, you could say, self-controlling. It must be autonomous. It must have mastery over itself must have control over itself. It's like the statement that uh, possession is nine tenths of the law. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so if there is something that one identifies as being I, mine, or myself, and but one doesn't have complete control over it, then from this point of view, based on that assumption of Indian thought, what one is taking to be self isn't really self. So if I say, I am the body, the body is myself, but I don't have this control over the body, then it means the body is not myself and the body is not mine. If I say feeling is myself, then I have to be able, that means that I have such control over feeling that if I want to feel happy and joyful, I just have to think, let me be joyful, and I'll be joyful. And if I'm feeling sad, upset, I just have to think, let me not be sad, and I won't be sad. Again, perceptions, if I'm seeing the same dreary sight every day, Maybe I'm living on a street with overfull garbage cans with the garbage falling <laughs> into the ground because the garbage collectors are on strike and cars are always honking their horns. You know, where I grew up, about two blocks away from the subway train, what do they call it, the elevated subway train, the L? And I would see that there were people who were living, you know, there were apartments that go right alongside the, the subway train. In fact, I think I had a friend who lived in an apartment right alongside that subway train when I was in elementary school and I would visit him. And always you hear the trains going by. I would wonder, how do people live? How can they fall asleep <laughs> in the apartments with the trains going by all the time? But they get used to it. But if one were living there, one would be thinking, let there be no perception of the sound of trains, but the trains go by, one has to hear them. And similarly with the will, I would be able to will whatever I want, I wouldn't be involved with any kind of conflict of motives, and I'd be able to be conscious of everything that I wanted, whatever I want. Okay, so the idea of self implies this mastery, autonomy, control over what is taken to be self. Just as in the state of Kosala, the state of Magadha, King Pasenadi or King Ajata Sattu they are the rulers of those states, and so those states are truly theirs. They are like the self in those states. 
And so they could control them, they could do anything they want in those states. So the self would have to have that kind of control over, or the person would have to have that kind of control over body, feeling, perception, if they were self. But because we don't have that control, as Satchika admits, therefore he sees the point already that these things are really unsatisfactory. They're really dukkha because we can't control them. We can't get rid of the suffering inherent in them just through our will. And so he's starting to see the point of the Buddha's argument. Let me put this one though, diagrammatically. Okay, so we might say that the king is the king precisely because he has this complete control in his realm. Actually, probably in reality, the king doesn't have such control. <laughs> you know, there are groups of rebels that might be plotting the rebellion in some secret corner of even of the capital, and maybe the king's concubines in the harem are secretly having affairs with secret visitors to the harem and the king's son might be a troublesome little brat who's planning to overthrow his father so the, then there can be robbers take the in, robbers who are conducting raids on the houses in the, in the kingdom so there can be many problems in the state but just sort of the common belief is that the king is the sovereign of the land, so in principle he has complete control, even if he doesn't in reality. Okay, so just as the king has complete control over the state, so if the five aggregates are the self, then the person should have that complete control over the five aggregates. But I put a cross there, an X, to show that the person doesn't have that control. And so then the conclusion follows that the five aggregates are not the self. Here. 
I just had my hand. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, it disappeared. It's, it's the space alien. It's not self. Okay. See, this is like an eraser, that's why you put it on the bottom. Yeah. See, I do have total control over it. <laughs> okay, so this is the point of the Buddha's argument, even though it's not really made very explicit. Okay, but now the Buddha... Did somebody want to say something about that argument? Any questions or...? The whole thing hinges on the human self, that self means you have control. That whole argument... (laughs) 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 Yeah, this is the way... Let us say, this is the way the concept of self would have been understood in India at that time. But also, maybe this is an implicit, it struck me after we had that conversation, maybe this is not something just peculiar to the Indian cultural view of that period, or philosophical view of that period, but maybe this is a kind of underlying, deep underlying, maybe subconscious presupposition that people take even though they might not think explicitly in terms of five aggregates, but they take the body to be mine, they take their feelings to be mine, they take their ideas to be mine, they take their intentions to be mine, they take their consciousness to be self. Richard, do you want to say something? Yeah, well, the the political form of it is sovereignty, both within the most famous expression is Louis XIV saying that the stock is small. Yeah. The state is me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. After me, the deluge. Yeah. The the uh, uh, the personal form of it derives also from from law. There's the idea that you you have control. You have the absolute right to control your own property, and that the basis of property is the body. Right. What's what's uh, what's yourself and what's uh, what's attached to yourself. That ownership is ownership is conceived as as the right to get the protection of the state if anyone denies your right to control your own property. And since the body is also considered property, mm-hmm. it then becomes a fundamental idea of personality. Also, in in India, I'd say you know even now this is a very fundamental idea in in the the. States of India, yeah. all the actual decisions are made by the top god. That mm-hmm. is, they're made by the chief minister. Mm-hmm. If you go to see the chief minister, say, of the state of India, like of Andhra Pradesh, like what? Say, of Andhra Pradesh, yeah. he walks down a hallway uh, as he leaves his office and asks for one sentence from each person in the hallway. People line the hallway and the stairs as he goes down. He has two aides on either side. The aide, he he listens to the sentence, he says something to one aide, he has the other aide write down the decision. And that's it. All of the ministers just wait. They, they, They pile up everything until it comes to his attention. They make no decisions on their own. So that I mean this is this is the Indian principle of rule. They, the king gets all the decisions. <laughs> but don't they say that India is one of the most lively democracies in the world? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Probably. 
hand them like our own. Yeah. <laughs> Please. No. Wait, take take the, the microphone. When I am in discussion with family members about things that sometimes we don't agree on or something, they'll say, Well, this is just who I am. Mm. This is this is me. I'm just this way. And um, and sometimes they might even say it about something about themselves that they don't like. I'm just stubborn. Yeah. And, and the idea there implies that they cannot change, yeah. that they are stubborn and yeah. they solidify it. Yeah. So that idea that we can change is also a factor in, in some of my confusion about self, but also in the idea that control is what we use to imply. It's implicit in, well, this is who I am and I don't want to change. Yeah. Implies you have the control not to change and then accidentally somebody says something. It implies that you don't have the control to change. No, that you mm -hmm. have the control to stay stubborn. Mm -hmm. This is who I am and I'm choosing not to change. I have power over my ability not to change. And then someone comes along and says something that wakes you up and changes your mind. Yeah. And you don't want to be stubborn anymore on that particular issue yeah. anymore. So the whole control to me somehow or other works in this argument. Mm -hmm. I'm having a taste, a little tiny taste of the idea of it. Mm -hmm. That I think I have control and therefore mm -hmm. that makes me stick my feet in the ground for different opinions or ideas or mm -hmm. dharma. Mm -hmm. And yet when I really open my mind, oh. I suddenly see more and I let go of those, and therefore I am impermanent. My ideas, yeah. my thoughts, my choices, yeah. and yeah. suddenly I let go of control, mm -hmm. and things are easier or yeah. less complicated. Yeah. Yeah. So I know, I know this idea is possible, that yeah. I think control is what makes me who I am, and yet letting go changes my whole life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Richard, and then Tracy after that. You said, you said something, uh, you didn't write out the board, but you said something a little earlier, but you know, when you talked about how Dukkha has been left out, yeah. Dukkha has been left out in the earlier discussion and hasn't quite come in yet, but, but that seems to be central to this issue. It's not whether you argue that it's total control or is, yeah. is the issue or not. But the idea of identifying yourself with your body yeah. uh, and the fact that you don't have complete control over it yeah. leads to dukkha. And I think the Buddha's teaching really is about about the how do you how do you get, how do you stop ha stop having dukkha? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, In fact, we're going to yeah. The to argument is going to come to the point of dukkha just in a little while. I just wanted to echo the point uh, the woman made earlier about the identification of the self and control. Mm -hmm. The idea that the defining feature of self is control. And um, it seems to be the case in, in Western theology, I'm no master of it, but um, in many religious systems, they, they conceive of a higher self Mm -hmm. or an indwelling self or a true self yeah. that has no connection yeah. with the person, with the aggregates, yeah. with the perceptions, yeah. and that the progress towards the true self is really giving up notions of control. Yeah. Or, or even the English word to suffer means to bear, you know, mm -hmm. to bear mm -hmm. the reality. I mean, I was just recently listening to some Christian theologians and I asked them to explain um, <coughs> what it means to progress towards the true self. Yeah. Or, and they said, paradoxically, it's to give up yeah. notions of control. Yeah. No, yeah. So that you're, it really is very much like um, we hear no, non-self or yeah, no, no self yeah. 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 It's curious to me that his argument is based on such a narrow definition of self. Of self. Yeah. I have to say I, I agree with that too. But it seems like this 
must have been the sort of the shared point of view or assumption of the period that for there to be a self, it's something that has to exercise control over those things that are taken to be the self or to belong to the self. And I, I, I can see that very often um, one would suddenly in Western conceiving of a higher self mm. all too easily becomes um, an identification. With yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Okay, I think I, I want to move on because I want to try to finish this. So, okay, now we see where the argument goes from here. Okay, so Satchika has admitted that he doesn't have that control over the five aggregates, and the Buddha has pointed out that there's a contradiction. Okay, now the Buddha is going to sort of approach the issue from a somewhat different angle. First, he starts off with the question about permanence or impermanence. What do you think is material form permanent or impermanent? Okay, then Satchika says it's impermanent. Then is what is impermanent? Here the question in Pali is sukha or dukkha va sukha va, which is translated suffering or happiness. And again, there's maybe the translation, it's a little bit unsatisfactory. Because the idea is that whatever is impermanent, it doesn't mean that whatever is impermanent is felt as being painful, a cause of misery, or as suffering, but rather the idea is that whatever is impermanent is incapable of providing some kind of permanent happiness, that whatever is impermanent is insecure, unstable, unreliable, and because it's insecure, unstable, unreliable, it can become a basis for suffering if one clings to it in the hope of finding stability, security, and something reliable within it. Okay, so Satchika admits that what is impermanent is dukkha, in the sense of unstable, unreliable, insecure. Okay, then he says, is what is impermanent dukkha and subject to change, fit to be regarded thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. Okay, so the same argument is presented is laid out in regard to all five aggregates. So all five aggregates are impermanent. Because they are impermanent, they're dukkha. And because they're dukkha, because they're impermanent, changing dukkha, they cannot be regarded as self, as mine, I, and myself. But they are. In other words, I'm impermanent, I'm suffering, and I'm subject to change. If that's me, what can I do about it? Yeah. <laughs> I think because the idea of self would have to involve, in this way of thinking, would have to involve permanence, unchangeableness, and not being subject to dukkha. Yeah, I know that, I know that, yeah. But, I mean, the Buddha was speaking within the context of that society and that culture. And actually what has stru struck me is that, especially nowadays, the idea of self and non-self from Buddhism is not particularly problematic for people. You know, because when people are taught or learn that Buddhism teaches there's no permanent self, no substantial self, it's not a big problem. What becomes a problem is, probably the, the real problem is teaching that everything is dukkha, because we're always still seeking sukha, 
pleasure or enjoyment in some form. But in India at that time, the big quest was to find the self and to find something to identify with as self. Okay, so now the five aggregates are all impermanent. They're all, because they're impermanent, they're bound up with their dukkha. Because they're impermanent and dukkha, they're non-self. And so now the Buddha brings in, maybe this is why the characteristic of suffering was left out from the earlier part of the discourse, in order to give it a more dramatic impact now at this point. So the Buddha says, what do you think, Adivesana, when one adheres to suffering, resorts to suffering, holds to suffering and regards what is suffering thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself, could one ever fully understood suffering oneself or abide with suffering utterly destroyed? And then Satchika answers, how is that possible, Master Gautama? No. Let me try to approach this by breaking the question down, actually to take it in two parts. Okay, first, when one regards the five aggregates as impermanent, then the point is that since they're impermanent, they're dukkha. And so what one is saying, this is myself, turns out to be dukkha, to be suffering. So what one is saying, at, what one is identifying with, this is myself, let's say when one identifies with anything and says, this is myself, what one is doing is adhering to dukkha, resorting to dukkha, holding to dukkha, and saying, what is dukkha, what is suffering, is myself. But in a way, that is what one doesn't want to do. One wants to get free from dukkha. And so if one is taking the five aggregates to be myself and their dukkha, then one is saying, what is dukkha is myself. So one is not going to get free from suffering by identifying with what is suffering and saying, what is suffering is myself. Were you going to say something, Andrea? No, I was just thinking, hence when they talk about the four noble truths in the brief, hence the five aggregates. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so that is the first part. Then the second part would be: Can if one is cl clinging to suffering and regarding it, this is myself. Could one ever fully understand suffering and completely destroy suffering? So, if one is clinging to suffering, what is suffering is myself then one is not going to be able to get to overcome suffering and to become fully liberated from suffering. Because one is taking what is suffering, in this case the five aggregates, to be the very essence of one's being. And so therefore one will go on adhering to the five aggregates, clinging to the five aggregates. Okay, so Satsuka says, no, Master Gotama. Then the Buddha says, <clears throat> what do you think, Satsuka? That being so, do you not adhere to suffering, resort to suffering, hold to suffering, and regard what is suffering thus? This is mine, this I am, this is myself. Then Satsuka says, how could I not, Master Gotama? Yes, Master Gotama. I have to say, it seems to me that these two paragraphs should have been, in, that they're in the wrong order, they should have been inverted. Doesn't that seem to be the case? Okay, let's take it with the inversion, the way I would <laughs> reorganize it. Okay, starting paragraph 21, the Buddha would say, what do you think, 
ugly vase in a leave out that being so. Are you adhering to suffering, resorting to suffering, holding to suffering, and regarding what is suffering thus? This is mine, this I am, this is myself. And Satchika says, how could I not, Master Gotama? Yes, Master Gotama. Then the question comes, when one adheres to suffering, resorts to suffering, holds to suffering, and regards what is suffering thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself, could one ever fully understand suffering oneself, or abide with suffering utterly destroyed? Which way does it make better sense? The way it's down here, with 2,000, maybe 300 years of tradition behind it, or the way I propose with about five seconds behind it. <laughs> Which way? Of course it has to be that way. <laughs> what? <laughs> Anybody disagree with her? <laughs> I abstain. <laughs> Anybody disagree with her? Second time. <laughs> Third time? <laughs> Okay, then the Buddha is going to show him sort of where he stands now, paragraph 22. It is just as if a man needing hardwood, searching for hardwood, were to go into the woods and he would see a large plantain. Does everybody know what a plantain is? It's really like a banana, a small kind of banana. He sees a banana trunk, straight, young, without the fruit bud core, then he cuts it down at the root and he starts unrolling it, looking for heartwood. But as he removes one sheath of the cell cellulose material after another, he doesn't even come upon softwood, let alone heartwood. And so, when you pressed, question, cross question me, when you were pressed, question, cross question me about your own position, you turn out to be empty, vacant, and mistaken. But it was you who were making this claim before the Vaisali assembly. I see no ascetic or Brahmin who can beat me in debate. If I were to get into debate with them, I would shake them, make them shiver, tremble, and um, I would make even the... I would make them shed um, sweat from the armpits. Then the Buddha says, now there are drops of sweat on your forehead <laughs> and they have soaked through your robe and the sweat is falling to the ground. <laughs> but there, there is no sweat on my body now. And then the, <laughs> the blessed one <laughs> uncovers his golden-colored body before the assembly. <laughs> he takes off his upper robe and he shows that he's completely, you know, calm, cool, free from sweat. You know, you could see that the preacher is preaching this way to the Buddhist assembly of lay devotees and he describes the Buddha in this way and the lay devotees are all sitting with their hands like this and going, sadhu, 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 wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> okay, then, at this point, Satchika, the great debater, is now sitting there. He's utterly humiliated, silent, dismayed, unable to respond. Okay, then one of the Lichavis gets up and he gives a simile to describe Satchika's position. He says, he gives a simile of a group of boys and girls 
they go out from the town or village to a pond, and then they, there's a crab living in that pond, and they pull the crab out from the pond, and then whenever the crab extends one of its legs, they smash it with sticks and stones, and so all, after some time, all of the crab's legs will be broken, smashed, and the crab would be unable to get back into the pond. And so, whenever Satchika made some assertion, form is self, feeling is self, the Buddha has <laughs> cut it off, broken it, smashed it, and so now Satchika cannot get back to the Buddha for the purpose of debate. I have to say, what strikes me a little bit about this kind of dialogue, you know, usually we think of, at least in the popular imagination, the Buddha is always very kind, gentle, soft, <laughs> you know, no competitive spirit. But there seems to be a pretty strong competitive spirit coming through the presentation of this dialogue. Like, you know, our hero is the Buddha, you know, super monk. <laughs> And sort of the bad guy is Satchika who challenges the Buddha in debate. And now we see the bad guy is all sweaty, silent, unable to debate any further. And Super Monk doesn't even give off any drops of sweat. Okay, so then Satchika now is humbled and now he wants to ask the Buddha some questions. Let there be no sound of the gong. You see, it's following my will. Well, <laughs> We'll let the sound of the wooden clock go, but no metal gong. You see? Just wooden block, no, no metal gong. Okay, now it seems to me that this part of the discourse, I can't believe that it was not framed by monks who knew the subtleties of the teaching. It always seems longer on Saturdays than on other days. <laughs> okay, I was saying that it seems to me that this part of the teach of the discourse had to be framed by monks, because what the, in effect what they're going to do is to have Satchika ask about the distinction between the disciple who was at the stage of a seka, that is a trainee, and one who is an arahat. And so if Satchika was not highly learned about the Buddha's teachings, he wouldn't have been able to frame the questions in this way. Okay, so Satchika asked the Buddha, he says, in what way is a disciple of the Master Gotama, one who carries out his instruction, responds to his advice, 
has crossed beyond doubt, become free from perplexity, gained intrepidity, and become independent of others in the teacher's dispensation or his teaching. Okay, so this is a question which is really asking what is the special or distinctive achievement of a stream entera, one who has entered the stream of the Dharma but has not yet become an arahat. So somebody is still undergoing the training. And then the Buddha replies in terms of the teaching of non-self, any kind of material form, whatever, past, future or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, the disciple sees all material form as it really is with proper wisdom, thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. The same with feeling, perception, mental formations and consciousness, he sees all consciousness as it really is, with proper wisdom, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. So that is the way one is a disciple of the Buddha who has crossed over doubt, <clears throat> become free from perplexity and so on, and become independent of others in the teaching. So the stream enterer, or once returner, or non-returner, <clears throat> They have seen the truth of the Dhamma. They have seen the five aggregates as being non-self. So they've obliterated all views of a self with regard to the five aggregates. And in this way they're utterly free from doubt because of direct insight into the teaching. Okay, but apparently Satchika, at least in the discourse, he knows the distinction between the trainee and the arahat. So now he asks, in what way is a bhikkhu, an arahat, one who has destroyed all the defilements, who has lived the holy life, done what had to be done, and so on, one who is completely liberated through final knowledge, Okay, now to be completely liberated, it's not enough simply to see the truth of non-self, but one has to develop that insight, develop that realization to the point that one eliminates all clinging. And so the Buddha answers, here, any kind of material form, whatever, past, present, or future, the Bhikkhu has seen material form as it really is, this is not mine, this is not I, this is not myself, and through not clinging, he is liberated. Any kind of feeling, perception, mental formations, any kind of consciousness, he has seen it all as being not mine, not myself, and through not clinging, he's liberated. So in other words, the ordinary, the noble disciple who's a trainee, stream enterer, once returner, non-returner, have seen the truth of non-self, but they've not yet liberated the mind from all clinging. So they still have work to do, they still have to develop that insight further, but when they develop the insight further to the ultimate point, then the mind is liberated from all clinging. And with the liberation of the mind from all clinging, then the disciple becomes an arahat, one who has destroyed all the defilements and is completely liberated through final knowledge. Okay, then the Buddha goes on and he says, he makes a very interesting point, he's now going to sort of highlight the difference between himself and those who are liberated through his guidance. He says, when a bhikkhu's mind is thus liberated, 
He possesses three unsurpassable qualities, unsurpassable vision or insight, unsurpassable practice or cultivation, and unsurpassable deliverance or liberation. But still, such a disciple honors, respects, reveres, and venerates the Tathagata. And for what reason? Because the Blessed One is enlightened and he teaches the Dhamma for the sake of enlightenment. The Blessed One is tamed, he teaches the Dhamma for the sake of taming oneself. The Blessed One is at peace and teaches the Dhamma for the sake of peace. He has crossed over the stream of birth and death and he teaches the Dhamma to cross others over. The Blessed One has attained Nibbāna and he teaches the Dhamma to bring others to Nibbāna. Okay, so when this is said, then Satchika, in effect, he apologizes to the Buddha. He shows how foolish he was to attack the Buddha and then he invites the Buddha, together with the Sangha, to come for the next day's meal. <clears throat> the Blessed One accepts in silence, and since Satchika was a wanderer, a wandering debater, he didn't have all of the foodstuffs for preparing a meal himself, so he asked the late Lichavis to contribute to bring food to offer to the group for the next day's meal. And so the Lichavis pre prepare some 500 ceremonial dishes of milk rice as gifts of food, and <clears throat> Satchika has various other foods of various kinds of good food prepared in his own park. And then he announces the time to the Buddha, and then he offers the meal to the Buddha. After the meal, I'm in paragraph 30 now, Satchika makes the wish, may the merit and the fruits of this deed of merit go to the happiness of the donors, that is, to the um, lichavis who offered the food. Then the Buddha says to Agivesana, he says what, again, this seems a little bit boastful, I have to say, whatever comes about from giving to a recipient such as yourself, one who is not free from lust, not free from hate, not free from delusion, that will be for the givers. In other words, the Lichavis gave their food, the food they prepared, to Satchika to give to the Buddha. So they get the merit from giving the food to Satchika, whose mind is not completely purified. And then the Buddha says, whatever comes about from giving to a recipient, such as myself, one free from lust, hate, and delusion, that merit will be for you. You see, Satchika presented the food directly to the Buddha and to the Sangha, and so Satchika will get the merits, these are the greater merits, that come from giving to one who is free from greed, hatred, and delusion. Okay, and that's the discourse. If there are just a few questions that could be answered briefly, I'll take them, and then the rest we'll have after the lunch period. Any quick questions? Okay, Susie. I'm just, the take, take, of the she's boasting, the boasting comes up regularly, or not exactly boasting, but these unsurpassable. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's an area where I struggle really yeah, hard yeah. because it's what I was trying to let go of another tradition. Yeah. It's always like, this is right. No one can argue with the Buddha. No one will ever successfully debate the Buddha yeah, because yeah. he's the, the one true knower. And I, I yeah. am surprised when I keep running into it and I wish you had an answer for it. I struggle and or believe that it's the human condition that when you believe something you want it to be the best. Yeah, yeah. The truest yeah. and that the people who put this down just added that in. It's hard for me to keep hearing this in sutras. The Buddha said, well, you know, nobody knows it as well as I do. <laughs> I am the best. Yeah, I'm yeah. the most unsurpassable. 
Yeah. And it's just like that first viewer who came up and who had first awakened when he came up and the guy said, wow, you're glowing. There's something about you. What is it? Oh, well, I'm, I'm yeah. an arrogant. And the guy yeah. Oh, yeah, sure, and ran away. Yeah. <laughs> and the Buddha then went on to teach it differently. Yeah, yeah. So that it could be heard. Yeah, so, yeah. I have to say, I don't know, you know, we have to remember that these texts were passed down for some 400, 500 years by oral transmission. So we don't really know for certain what did the Buddha say himself and what could the transmitters who would have been involved in debates with the followers of other schools in India, other schools of religion and philosophy in India. And I think... You say the human, it's sort of the natural human tendency is to exalt our teacher, our founder, our, our leader. And so no such, such ideas could have come into the, or such statements could have come into the text in order to try to show, you know, our teacher is better than your teacher. We are the ones who have the absolute truth. At least the one thing that's certain for me or that, is that for Buddhism, you know, the way to deliverance is not by believing something, but by following a course of practice that will lead to personal insights. So all of this, it's not saying you have to accept that the Buddha is number one, <laughs> but, um, you know, that could have just come out of the tone of religious controversy of the period. And the important point is what is there to understand and to practice. That's the way I approach it. Andrea might have something to And who's to say that the Buddha has to be, quote, nice? I mean, wait, wait. Who's to say that the Buddha has to be, quote, nice? Yeah. That's a real misconception that religious figures have to be nicey wicey. Yeah. Um, he doesn't really come across mean, if you yeah, yeah. Um, but he has a definite personality. Yeah. If you want sweetness in life, you have to look at Anna. He really is very yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. He was a Probably always that way. He's just a very fine guy. I can't stand Kasapa. Okay? Excuse me? I can't stand Kasapa. Doesn't mean he wasn't enlightened. They don't have their personalities. Yeah. I just think that people think that everybody's supposed to be floating up and down in the deer park with sit playing. It's not necessarily how it is. <laughs> and just because someone might be harsh, for instance, better well, Maha Kasapa, he was kind of harsh, wasn't he? Yeah, he was harsh, yeah, yeah. He was, okay? He was still very good teacher of uh, Buddhism. Yeah. He wasn't Ananda. He was yeah. Sariputta. Sariputta also seems rather nice. Yeah, very soft, yeah. Very soft. Not, Ananda is the one with Ayala, like I said. But it, it, yeah, that's a good point. It, it, but I, I have to say, some of the statements that we find in the text still seem a little bit too boastful for me. But also, maybe one has to say that, at least in certain contexts, the Buddha since he is the one who's sort of founding the, te the teaching, has to give some support to his, to inspire confidence in others, let's say. And in that period, it might have been the way that teachers set forth their teaching. You know, if, you, if one says, yes, everything is good, one guy is teaching, everybody is annihilated with the breakup of the body after death, somebody says there's no result of good and bad deeds, and, you know, we say, okay, we all have part of the truth. Maybe your truth, you have the truth from one angle, I have the truth from, this one has the truth from another angle. Maybe there are some faults in my teaching, trying to be modest. Then you're not really establishing, you might call the Dhamma in the world. So maybe we should say... Who we spoke with. Excuse me? It depends on who we're speaking with also. Yeah, yeah. Brahmin came to him, like, flipped out. My son, that thing great, he kicked me out, I'm starving, I'm on the street. That, that, that's a sutra which I love, because he goes to the Buddha. The sons. Yeah, he said that my, my son was in great wife and kicked me out like a dog, like a dirty dog. And I'm yeah, that comes from... scared and sad and everything. And yeah. the Buddha basically, he doesn't try to teach him the dog. He yeah. just says, I know what you do. Go out in the middle of the day when everybody's out. Yeah. And just say what you said to me and come back to me. Yeah. Advice. yeah, the Buddha gave him some verses to recite to his yeah. son. Yeah. But it was basically the one that embarrassed yeah. him. Yeah. 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 I think it depends upon who he spoke to, also. He it, could be kind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, we'll end here, and then we'll come back. Maybe we'll meet at 12.15 to carry on discussion period. Okay, so we end with the sharing of the merits. Akasata chabhumata teva naga mahitika punyanta manumodipa chirang rakantu sasanam Akasata chabhumata teva naga mahitika punyanta manumodipa chirang rakantu desanam Akasata chabhumata Teva Naga Mahitika Punyanta Nanumodipa Chirang Rakantu Mang Parang Eta Patacham Ehi Sampadam Pundi Sampadam Sabe Deva Nanumodantu Sabe Bhutanumodantu Sabe Satanumodantu Sabha Sampati Siddhya Pavagupadhyaya Vichiheta To E tantare satakayupapanna Rupi arupi cha sanya sanino Dukha pamu chantu prosantu nibhutim Okay, I just want to mention to next Saturday there won't be the class but the next class will be the week after September 18th. <laughs>